From Hebrews chapter 12, which is where we are. The blood of Abel speaking graciously, but the blood of Jesus speaks even more graciously than the blood of, of Abel because he speaks from heaven over you. And we're looking at Hebrews chapter 12, what it means to live it out lives of faith, trusting in Jesus, walking in his love, responding to him. And in the end of chapter 10 of Hebrews, is this admonition for us not to shrink back and be destroyed, but to be those who believe and are saved. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we have all of the examples of those who've gone before us looking to the promise of God, looking to Jesus and exhorting us to fix our eyes. Can we say that? Fix our eyes, to fix our eyes on Christ. And that's just not physically because we can't see Christ right now, but the focus of all of our attention, the focus of all of our desire, the focus of our living, the priorities of, of who we are and what we do is rooted and aimed completely um, in the Lord, listening to be obedient and quick to him. So we want to be people with our eyes fixed on Jesus, his salvation, his example, so that we can find strength and encouragement. Need encouragement today? <laughs> I need lots of encouragement today, so I hope you've been praying for me. But we are in a, in a context where we all need the word of encouragement, and today, specifically, God has a word of encouragement for you. And it's rooted in the fact that he loves you, and he has called you to be his children, his sons and his daughters. And he is treating you the way a perfect parent, because he is our perfect Heavenly Father, would treat their children in love, opening the road for that which is best, but also keeping us on the road when we stray. So I'm going to read from the beginning of chapter 12 just to put us in context. Verse 1, but we're going to be focusing on verse 4 through to 11. Let's listen to the word of God together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despising its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation or the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. On Veterans Day, I can't think of a more fitting verse. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Those of you that have been through boot camp, I don't, I've never heard anyone describe boot camp as pleasant. But God, in the discipline, is providing training and preparation that later will provide a harvest of righteousness and of obedience and of blessing. 
Our key verse is verse 5. Have you forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons and as daughters? The encouragement that God has for us is he does, doesn't treat us just like the rest of his creation. He doesn't treat us just as, as employees or as, as people that are out there. He has adopted us through the blood of Jesus and he now treats us as his children. And he has made a commitment to us to keep treating us as his children, to keep loving us and to keep building into us. What a word of encouragement. God is not going to give up on you. God is not going to give up on your family. He's not going to give up on his church, even when it's hard and even when it is so, so difficult. This is the word of encouragement that we quickly forget when hardship comes, that we are, in fact, being treated as his sons and as his daughters. Don't forget that word of encouragement. He loves you. He delights in you. And so he disciplines you. We're going to be learning about how that love is expressed and how we can also learn to be disciple makers. Have you ever noticed the connection between the word disciple and discipline? If we are going to be like the Lord Jesus, if we are going to be like our Heavenly Father, then we need to be discipled. And the root of that is we need to lead a life of discipline under his authority and under his care for us. So if you have your sermon notes, you can follow with me. Um, discipleship is learning to walk in the Father's love. God is wanting you and me to learn to walk step by step, every step. The hard steps, the easy steps, the ones that are going uphill, the ones that are going downhill. Every step, he wants us to learn to walk in his love. And that is what discipleship is, walking hand in hand with the Lord there. And three, two things to help us in, in understanding to walk in the Lord's love. First is to consider the Father's love for Jesus, his son. We learn in Romans 8 that uh, the answer to the question, what can separate us from the love of God? You learn the answer, what is it? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in life or death, nothing in, in angels or principalities. Oh, I got to stop there. Do we still have, have that, that picture, Steve? We still have it if we can. They, they can try to find it. This is, this is from Thursday when we were walking around the church. And, uh, and Nelson said, John, there's, there's a giant angel in the sky. And, and, and you can see this massive angel. And, and, and verse 1 talks about being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that point to Jesus. And so this was our witness as we were praying over our campus. And the one thing I want to encourage you with is God's angels are really big. <laughs> They're really big. They're a lot bigger than you and I can see. And even the clouds bear testimony to that. And there is encouragement when we look in any direction and we keep our eyes on Jesus, that there we will find, thanks so much, guys, there we will find the blessing pointing back to the Lord. So consider the Father's love and not only his love for us, but his love for Jesus. You know, we're planning a baptism later on in this month, and, and we have, you know, people that have been waiting and patient. And uh, when we think of Jesus' baptism, he came to John, and John said, Jesus, I, I can't baptize you because I'm baptizing for repentance of sin. You don't have any sin in you. I should be baptized by you. And Jesus said, so be it. But he, he is doing it to fulfill what was right as an example, an obedience to the Father and as an example to us. Remember what happened when he was baptized? He came out of the water and the heaven was opened and something like a dove, the Spirit of God, came and alighted on him. And then a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. The very heaven opened and God spoke the love to his son. So proud of his son. As Jesus obeyed him, even in baptism, the sinless son of God. It happened again when he was on the mountain with his three disciples and, and he, they saw him in glory. And he was there with Moses and Elijah and he was radiant. And there the heavens opened and the voice of God spoke. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. 
Consider the Father's love for his son Jesus and that he is going to pour out that same love that he poured out to his son Jesus now to you and to me. That's the word of encouragement that we have together in Christ today. But there's a second component in learning to walk in the Father's love and that we want to trust his love for us as his children. There is in chapter 12 these two verses that are quoted from Proverbs chapter 3. And we're all excited about a word of encouragement, and then we go, whoa, I didn't expect that for encouragement. It says in, in Hebrews 12, quoting Proverbs, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone who he receives as his sons and daughters. Now hang with me. We want to trust his love for us as children. Now, a lot of you have memorized Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Great verse. We love it. We all love it. But you know what is never quoted in the New Testament? Out of all the passages of chapter 3 in Proverbs, they quote this one. You see, the trusting in the Lord with all your heart follows this verse 3 of binding love and loyalty around your neck like a lay. That God is wanting us to be faithful in our relationship with Him. And that God wants that sealed upon our heart. And we need to learn to trust His character as our Father. And then it follows through that that trust is first expressed financially. And it's first expressed in placing him first in every way. And that begins with the practical stuff. And so honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then God will bless you. And don't despise the Lord's discipline. He's teaching you something in order to multiply blessing. He is working in you in order to teach you how to be wise. So that there'll be discernment and understanding in your heart. This is all Proverbs 3. So that no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you will have wisdom in your heart in this active relationship with God. And you will not act foolishly and of all the consequences, but you will have the wisdom and the blessing of the power of God. We need to learn to trust God as his children because discipline begins. It begins with the little things. The Bible calls our finances the little things. It begins with the little things, with our children. We all started. My mom taught us the very first thing you teach your your children. I've said this before, how to sit, how to stay, and how to come. And we worked really hard really hard on how to sit, how to stay, how to come. They were the first things, the very simple things, because if you can get those simple things down, then the bigger things come and they follow naturally in their place. And, and so it's the same in the discipline of the Lord. The first thing he teaches us is the simple stuff of what to do with the physical, tangible stuff that he's given us already as a gift. It's just like, you know, giving your, giving your child your first allowance. You teach them how to divide it up. You take a tenth for the Lord. You take a tenth and you put it away and you save it. And then you take the 80% and you can play with it and you can live off all you want. You want to save to buy something, you want to do something else, but they learn in a little bit. And that's the same with the Lord. Okay? So we learn to trust Him in His love and His faithfulness to us. Discipleship is learning to walk in the Father's love. But secondly... The Father expresses His love in discipline. Now, that may surprise some of you, um, but actually, when you think about it, if you're a parent or you've had a parent, um, that is so real. And God expresses His love for us in discipline. Now, discipline has two sides to it. Now, what kind of parent would let their child run into the road and start playing. Only an evil, wicked parent who didn't love the child. The love of that parent gets them out there to protect the child from that which will kill and harm them. 
What kind of parent would provide their child cocaine and say, hey, start taking cocaine? Only a wicked, evil parent would do that. Any parent would want to stop their child from that which would harm and hurt them. And so it really is very logical for us that God disciplines us in love. Because even as parents, we've, we've done such a poor job often. All mixed stuff, but, but God's love is pure and perfect. And he disciplines and he's committed to disciplining you and me out of his love for us. Um, in verse 10, we, we'll read this together. Read it with me. God disciplines us for our good. For our what? Our good? For his good? No, for our good. Okay, let's read it again. God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. So there is here a very clear direction and purpose. He is wanting our good. Everything that he does, he wants our good. And the intent and the goal of his discipline is that we would share his character of holiness. Now, God's described in two key words. If you want to understand the nature of God, there are two key words in, in Scripture that gives it. One is love. Can we say that? Love. God is love, okay? And we see that all through Scripture. We see it uh, expressed in Jesus supremely in his death and resurrection for our sin, okay? But the second is that God is holy. Can we say that? God is holy. He is pure and he is strong. He is absolute in his love. His love is not the kind that's going to turn around and betray you tomorrow. His love is not going to go commit adultery on you. His love is holy and pure and righteous in every single way. So God is holy and God is love. Two sides to the same coin of God's character. Now, coins are going to be um, obsolete pretty soon. I mean, not many of us collect coins and the way we used to and change and use it because we've gone basically almost to a cashless society. Pretty soon we'll be in a cashless society. The big news actually is not just the election, though that's massive for what's happening. The big news is what's ha happening economically around the world and moving us to a digital economy. Because when a digital economy happens, there will be no cash. And if there is no cash, there is no freedom and there is no independence. And in fact, you are then under the totalitarian control of whoever is controlling the digital economy for everything you buy and everything you sell. Sound familiar, those of you who know your Bible? That's happening right now. In fact, whole nations are voting on going completely digital. And you just pray that there's some form of digital cash that will not be monitored or controlled by the authorities. Massive, massive upheavals that are shifting. COVID, what we're facing, is nothing compared to what we have. The whole internet revolution is just the foretaste of what is taking place right now. Okay? So God is preparing us because God knows the future. But a coin, which won't be around much longer maybe, has two sides, right? And one side, that coin is love and of discipline. But the one side of loving discipline is encouragement. Can we say encouragement? Encouragement. You praise. You encourage. You say thank you. You say well done. You say fantastic. I am so proud of you. Praise God whenever we do something well. That's the, that's the way God starts with us. Is this wonderful encouragement. And discipline includes encouragement. Some of us just have discipline categorized as being the negative side. No. God's discipline, as he leads us forward, he is pulling us forward. He is guiding us forward with his encouragement, with positive reinforcement all the time. And as parents, I mean, I, I, Trisha is not here today, but my wife is one of the most amazing uh, teachers and moms to discipline. She's worked with special needs kids for years and years. We've had 28 years. We had street kids live with us who weren't our own and adopted them as Tanai kids, all kinds of settings. But my wife is so good at bringing encouragement into even some of the most negative situations. She sets a goal of holiness, a goal that we value, and says, let's walk that goal together. And so there is moving forward, presenting blessing ahead of us, like God does, and said, we want to get there. Let's take baby steps toward that. 
So if she's got a, I, she substitute teaches, if she's got a class that is just a mess, she is a master of setting a goal for the class. You know what? We're going to get points for good behavior. And if we get enough points in this class, by the end of the class, we're going to have this reward. And it is amazing. Discipline points to the end goal and helps us take steps, get there, and encourages and praises you every step that you take toward that goal. Praise God for a loving father. Amen? And, and some of you have never experienced that kind of discipline. But we can learn it from our Heavenly Father. And those of you that have, you know the motivation that comes from being encouraged step by step. That's the kind of father that we have. So the one side of the coin of loving discipline is encouragement. Can we say encouragement? Because God disciplines us for our good. So he's pointing to the good. He's pointing to the blessing. So it's the kind of thing where... You have a child and, and, and they're, they're riding their bike really well and they're doing what you told them to do, riding the bike. And you say, wow, you're riding the bike. That is so cool. That's so good. You know what? You keep having that kind of discipline. You are going to be amazing when it comes to driving a car when you turn 16. You're pointing them forward to the blessing that's coming. Or you know what? You handled, you handled that little bit of money so well. You handled you know, your, your, your allowance or you handled the money you made so well. I can trust you with $10. I will be able to trust you with $100 someday. And you know what? Someday when you're older, God may be entrusting you with thousands and thousands of dollars. Because when you do what's right with a little bit, God is going to be able to trust you with a lot. That's the discipline that God gives through encouragement. And that's what he gives to each one of us. Whatever steps of faith you are taking to Jesus right now, no matter how little they are, no matter where you are coming from, when you take a little step of faith with Jesus, I pray that you hear the encouragement of praise God. You are moving forward toward the blessing that God wants to continue to multiply in your life. That's the kind of God we have. He disciplines us for our good to move us forward into the blessings of his kingdom. Amen? But there's another side to the coin, and that's called punishment. You say, Pastor, you mean God punishes? Yes. You mean God punishes families? Yes. You mean God punishes individuals? Yes. You mean God punishes nations? Yes. <laughs> he encourages them and he leads with the love of Jesus. But the other side of discipline is punishment. And you know, as I, as I said before, a parent that doesn't punish. I, I remember Ben, he was born over in another country and it was very poor and there were garbage dumps and all kinds of stuff. Things, it was not a clean place, believe me. They did not sanitize between every person we were there. And one day he came out of a garbage dump where he, that was beside, there garbage everywhere because there's no garbage pickup. And, and he, he came out with, with a dead rat, okay? And he was fascinated by this dead rat. Now, you know, as a little kid, they put everything in their mouths, right? Now, me as a parent, am I going to say, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben, just put it in your mouth. Do whatever you want. That's okay. That's cool. No. As a parent, you take that rat away. But if he starts whining, he says, I want that rat. I want that rat. I want that rat. You say, no. And if he goes back a next time and he takes another rat, at that point, you've got a consequence. You've got punishment. Okay, the first time he's learning and you're patient and you explain, okay, this is, and sometimes they understand better than others. They don't always understand. The second time, there's a consequence. The third time, they really need to make sure it never happens again. If that, if, and sometimes you don't get a third time. Okay, so, so there is punishment is a part of God in discipline. Now he punishes us for our good. <laughs> is all punishment, is all bad things God's punishment? No. We're in a fallen world. Satan's out there. There's sin out there. He wants bad things to happen so that you are killed and you are destroyed. He's working against you. But God will put the fences up and sometimes those fences are painful because he wants to keep us in the path of following in the kingdom and the way of Jesus. Okay? So he's not afraid to punish. Because he's a good father, and he is pointing us toward his highest and his best. In fact, it says in Hebrews that if there is no discipline, 
then it really shows a lack of love. It says, even our earthly fathers disciplined us. We respect them for it. They did it poorly a lot of times, <laughs> but they did the best they could. And your parents may have been good or bad at disciplining. I don't know. But they were trying the best from what they knew. How much more do we submit to our perfect father who disciplines completely in love? We submit to him and to his discipline because he is not afraid with every son. I mean, you think of a soldier. You think of a sergeant. I mean, we have, we have some of you that have been in Marines. You've been in all, every, every part of the military here in our church. <laughs> And, and you are not afraid to discipline those under your command because you know what they need to be trained and be prepared. And if you do not prepare them, it's on you because you haven't prepared them for what they need for battle. And God prepares us and he's willing to let us go through, but he goes through it with us. Remember, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. So he walks, that's the difference between Satan and God. Satan will throw his garbage at you and run away and leave you to rot. God will walk through with you and in a direction where he is making you holy and building in you the love and the holiness of God. That's always our goal as parents. It's always our goal as friends. We want the love of God and we want the holiness side by side growing. Amen? Okay, and that's our purpose. And so there is, there is a place for punishment. But we punish willful disobedience and stop rebellious evil. So you want to cut out things of the flesh and selfishness. Cut out foolishness that is not wise. But it begins with the heart and the will and rebellion. Rebellion is witchcraft. Rebellion is demonic. Rebellion opens the door for the demonic to take root and control. If you have a rebellious spirit, you lay it before the Lord because that is an open door for the enemy to come in and take you further than you want to go. Okay? Now, in disciplining, it needs to be age appropriate. Okay? So, a discipline for a two year old is very different from a 12 year old, is very different from a 40 year old. And, and we have to have wisdom in terms of these two sides of encouragement. And you have more opportunity to balance the encouragement and the punishment the earlier or the younger someone is. But the longer you go without that healthy balance, the harder it gets to bring in elements of correction. You, you, you know, once they hit the teen, teen years and some of your teenagers here, your ears tend to get tuned out to your parents and praise God for the church where there are other aunts and uncles that come alongside and that sometimes get our ears, okay? Once you hit adulthood, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. We basically just have encouragement. And once in a while, they'll ask for advice, but it's a whole different world. And so there is this we, when we discipline, especially in the younger years, you want to discipline willful disobedience. Accidentally spills the milk, hey, may have gone over your lap, may have ruined your supper, but that's not what you discipline. <laughs> that's where you show grace. But if the child picks up his cup and he throws it at you, okay, he may be young and not realizing, he's just enjoying throwing things. But once you teach him, you know, that's not something we do, and then he does it again, okay, we're going to have to take some action. You take a little bit, incremental. We don't leapfrog and, and bring in, you know, capital punishment. <laughs> you do incremental to the age and to the situation. And you communicate very clearly, okay, what is needed. So if you're teaching your child how to come, all right, so you say to your child, okay, hey, we're going to be going in a couple minutes. I know you're having lots of fun, but we need to clean up. We're going to be leaving in a couple minutes. And I want you, when I, when I say it's time to go, I want you to be cheerful and I want you to come gladly. Okay? So you say it again. Okay, remember, we're going to be leaving in a couple minutes. I'm going to come over and you're going to be, and you have them repeat. I'm going to be cheerful. Okay, great. So you come. Two or three, four or five minutes go, however long you said. And you go over and say, okay, it's time to come, Becca. Time to come. Okay. And they come and they come cheerfully. What do you do? 
You praise them. Come on, you got to learn something. You got you to praise. Say, yeah, yes, you did it. I am so glad. I can't tell you how happy that makes me as your dad. When you come, when I want. That is just amazing. Don't go light on the praise. It's not fake. It's real. And, and, and when they do something right, praise them as much as you can. Now, if they don't, and they're sitting there waiting, there's that moment of decision, right? Am I going to go? Am I not going to go? Am I going to flee? Am I going to stay? We've all seen it as parents. And some of you may be right there in your relationship with God right now. You may be in that moment of decision, saying, am I really going to obey my Heavenly Father and trust Him, or am I going to go back and do things my way, the way I did it yesterday, the way I did it last week? Am I going to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, or am I going to live by what I want, when I want, as I want? And those are times when you pray as a parent, and you wait, and you give them time. But then if they, if they run away, <laughs> at that point, say, okay, you want to make the, the punishment fit the crime. Don't overdo the punishment. God doesn't do that. He's perfect. Because you're wanting to win them, not destroy them. And so, and so you bring them back, and you say, okay, we're going to do this again. <laughs> and you sit them down. Say, I'm going to call. And when I call, you come. Okay, you ready to come? Okay, so you say, hey, time to come back up. And if they come, what do you do? Come on, you got to get this down, guys. Well done. But if they don't, then you say, okay. And you may, depending on their age. And I, I, in, in you, until you get it down. But you, you do not quit. A parent that loves a child and wants them to learn and be trained will take the time and the energy to train. And when it comes to willful rebellion at that point, you have to have a consequence that matches. So if they have scribbled on the wall, you want them to clean it up. If they've made a mess, you want them to fix it up. You don't just do things that are negative and don't help them undo the wrong that they have done. Okay? You understand? So discipline always has a goal in mind to share God's holiness, to move forward in what is good. Our world has lost all sense of discipline. Discipline and respect for authority has just gone out the window in our nation. Discipline in the church is non-existent. Um, people are disciplined. One of the signs of the end times is that ch children will rebel against parents and won't listen to their, their, their discipline. But when there is a loving Heavenly Father and you come under His love and you come under and submit to His discipline, you will be blessed because He has your blessing in mind. And your best. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. So, encouragement, punishment, the two sides of one coin of discipline. It takes wisdom as how to use it. It takes the fear of God. You're going to learn to pray. <laughs> You're going to learn to pray when it comes to this. But then his holiness in our character is for everyone's good. When we submit to God's discipline, not only are you blessed, not only are the people around you blessed, not only is the community blessed, everyone is blessing, is blessed. And, and I want to encourage you, it is worth the effort. It is worth the effort of discipleship. The root of disciple is discipline. It is worth the effort of learning the foundations of discipline in your life. Because when you have them, they are tools forever. When you learn those Bible verses as a young child, they are with you forever. When you learn how to play the piano, it is with you forever. When you learn how to make your bed, it's with you forever. When you learn how to cook, you always have that skill and ability. When you learn how to forgive, you are now equipped for every relationship. When you learn how to pray and apply the blood of Jesus, you can go anywhere, anytime, anything. You can even go to Japan, Lisa, and you will be okay. Because you have learned the discipline under the Lord, and you can even go to the battlefield, and you will have the hand of God upon you. So there is the Father expresses his love and discipline. Do not regard lightly God's discipline, but thank him for it. And finally, make an investment and endure. 
to see the harvest. Verse 11, uh, Trish and I, I cannot tell you how many times we said this verse to each other when we just didn't have the energy or strength to follow through with our kids because they were testing the lines. You know how it is. They always test because they know they wear you down, they wear you down, and you get so tired that they're going to wear you out. And they cannot wear you out because you have to win when it comes to discipline. And we would say, peaceful harvest of righteousness. Can you say that? peaceful harvest of righteousness. We want that harvest. And to get a harvest, what do you have to do? You have to plant seeds. You have to plant good seeds. That's the encouragement. And as, pa as parents are always planting those good seeds and they will grow. They will grow in time. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years down the road, those seeds will grow. The things of God's word, the things of love, the things of salvation, they will grow. But also if you want a harvest, you have to pull the weeds, right? And, and the smaller the weeds are, the less disruptive to the plants around them. And they're a lot easier to pull when they're young. And you, if you're a new Christian, submit to the Lord's discipline. Get another Christian alongside you saying, will you be my accountability partner? Because the faster you learn by the Spirit to pull those weeds out of your life, the easier it will be and the more blessed you will be. But the longer you, you let those weeds grow and you say, oh, later on, the more entwined the roots of those weeds are in all the areas of your life and the more painful it will be when they are ripped out. And God has committed himself to rip them out. So let him, the faster you submit, the easier it is. It's like cancer, get it, get it quick. <laughs> Don't let it grow. Don't let it fester. Okay, so this peaceful harvest, can we say that? Peaceful harvest of righteousness, okay? Verse 11, let's read it. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but... Oh, later on, however, it produces a peaceful harvest of righteousness. And that's what I want for our kids. That's what I want in my life. That's what I want for our family. That's what I want for this church it's what I want for Hawaii. It's what I want for our nation, a peaceful harvest of righteousness. But it comes under the authority and the discipline of the Lord. Three things that we endure. I'm just going to list them off here. In verse 2, Jesus endured the cross. He endured other people's sin. And sometimes we just endure when other people around us and some of you, your kids, are ripping your hearts out. And you know the pain. But we endure the cross, and we keep forgiving, and we keep loving, and we keep praying, and we keep applying the blood. But he also it says in verse 3, that consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinful men. There is opposition from sinful people who badgered Jesus. And he said, don't grow weary and lose heart when you have opposition from sinful people, it will come. And there will be those who hate you. And there will be those who oppose you. And they will, there will be those who are not trying to love you and lead you in good. There are those who are just trying to hurt and push you out of the way. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. Your father's still with you. But then the third is endure hardship as discipline, training us to stand strong. It says in verse 7, it says, endure hardship as discipline. Whatever hardship you are undergoing, God says he is right there. What's going to separate you from God's love? Nothing. Nothing. So as you walk through that hardship, God is right there with you. Right there, step by step. Going to lead you through it. And he is going to equip you and give you what you do not have in your character. And prepare you for all that we need for the future in Jesus Christ. To overcome with victory and with power. Um, this week's pretty special. The November 11th is not only Veterans Day. Uh, this week is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower Compact. 400 years ago on November 11th, the Mayflower underwent all kinds of storms and there was danger from shoals and they were planning to go to Virginia and they couldn't and there was law and order in Virginia. Instead, they had to stop uh, by Cape Cod over across from Provincetown. And there, they were terrified of entering in and going on land and having no government, no one to police them, no rules, no laws, nothing. And so they came under God and they made a compact, which later became the foundation 
of Declaration of Independence and, and of our Constitution, all of those truths. And as you know, many of you, that compact begins with, in the name of God, amen. Can we say that? In the name of God, amen. They were coming under God and saying yes. And I invite you to come under God. And that little 15-line compact, 12 of them, are just, the, the, uh, three of them were just on, on the, the signatures. But those 41 people, they knew that they had to come under some authority and some discipline or they could not trust themselves and what would happen. That's why for our nation, we say as our motto, in God we trust. Because when we lose that, we lose it all. And so they said for the advancement of the faith and for the advancement of, of, of the Christian faith in God, we make this compact. So I want us to stand right now and we want to come underneath the loving discipline of God. And would you invite God to discipline you? <laughs> invite him to refine you inside. And, and invite him to make you pure as gold. Invite him to make you holy, even if it is painful. It is worth the glory. All discipline for the moment seems painful. Later, it yields, remember, a peaceful harvest of righteousness. So Lord, right now we come, we invite you to come and we want to come voluntarily. We want to run to you. You invite us saying, come. And so we come. And some of us are just kind of hesitant, waiting. Do we come? Don't we come? Can I really trust God? Or I just want to do what I want to do. But Lord, we come under your discipline, voluntarily, joyfully. We run into your discipline because it's there we are safe. It is there we have blessing. Oh, Father. And I pray that if anyone's been running away, God, that you just put a wall in front of them. God, I pray it won't be too painful, but Lord, make it painful enough to turn us around and in the right track. And Lord, some people in their relationships are running in the wrong direction. Lord, whatever it takes to stop them and turn them around back to you. Lord, to heal marriages. Father, for children to get right with their parents. Father, to root out rebellion and witchcraft and, and the roots of the demonic. God, we come and we say, Lord, discipline us. Lord, we want to come under your love. Your encouragement, God, thank you. Lord, your correction and your punishment. But God, that we would be refined. And that we would grow in your love and in your holiness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. See